Hi everyone, um, and good afternoon to our uh, first of our autumn webinar series um, in 2024. So from the Innovation Value Institute here at Maynooth University. Uh, so today we're talking about uh, our research support and and um, also innovation vouchers, which are which are one of those um, supports that we'll, we'll concentrate on today. So the IVI um, in Maynooth University is a research institute can help organisations um, leverage uh, both Irish state funding um, supports to do research uh, that benefit organizations, but also uh, research supports from, from the European Union. And today we'll, we'll be talking um, about those different supports, um, how they can be applied for, uh, and also we'll hear some stories from organizations um, who have taken advantage of these supports and, and some of the success stories that, that they have uh, from those. Okay, so, uh, our agenda for today uh, looks like this. Um, we ha uh, for, I'm just going to do a quick introduction just to the, uh, give an overview of the supports um, you know, and we'll talk through a little bit this, uh, this agenda. Uh, at 10 past three then we will um, also have um, Imar Carty, who's, who's Group Strategy and E-Commerce Director for Kilkenny Design to talk about an, uh, an Enterprise Ireland Innovation Partnership project um, that we worked on together uh, and, and give an overview of that. Uh, from 20 past three then we have John Durkin, who is a chief technologist, uh, the technology division in IDA Ireland. And he'll talk a bit about how clients of IDA Ireland have, have taken advantage of supports that, that are offered by uh, IDA Ireland. Uh, from 3.30, we have Karen Kelly, who's a CEO and founder of Panacea Flow Limited. Uh, she's also an advanced nurse practitioner and we'll hear about a digital health application that um, Karen is developing um, using uh, initially the, the innovation voucher supports, but uh, who has also been, you know, um, uh, working with, uh, with other Enterprise Ireland and supports. Um, after that, then we have uh, Erica Tegolo and Lirian Gorda de Silva, who are working on a European Union um, project called Entrust. This is a Marie Curie uh, Slavowska action um, funded by the European Commission. Um, which looks at uh, agri um, data in the agricultural um, technology sector or technology in, in the agricultural sector. Uh, and they'll talk a little bit about um, what they're doing uh, in, in that particular project. Uh, after that, then we have Rajat Singh, who is a program manager here at the Innovation Value Institute. And Rajat manages our uh, program called Rethink Redesign, whereby we leverage primarily the Innovation Voucher Program from Enterprise Ireland, but also Innovation Partnerships and other programs were, were appropriate um, to, to help organizations with their research challenges uh, in, in adapting and, and um, you know, using digital technologies for uh, the business benefit. Um, from four o'clock then we'll have uh, Professor Marcus Helfert, uh, the IVI director, to talk a little bit in general about some of the other supports that, that, that are available. And then uh, from 10 past four, we'll, we'll have a panel uh, discussion and Q&A. So as you can see um, on the right hand of my screen, you can ask questions throughout the, um, um, the, the presentations. We'll collate those for uh, putting to the panelists at the Q&A session at, towards the end. Um, and also just to point out that we are recording the webinar um, for on-demand access uh, later on. Uh, we'll post it to our YouTube channel uh, once, uh, you know, once, it, once it's been downloaded and, and edited a little bit. Okay, so on with the webinar. Um, so first of all, I'll just give it a quick background on uh, IVI. Uh, so we're a research institute um, in, uh, based in Minute University. And we're, our primary uh, focus is on digital transformation uh, for innovation and how data can also be used for, for innovation and digital transformation in organizations. We, we work uh, internationally, not just uh, in Ireland. And we were established um, originally as a collaboration between Minute University and, and Intel almost 20 years ago. Uh, we've you know, achieved a, a lot of funding from many different programs, and we'll talk a little bit more about those today. But we organize a lot of member events, um, and we co-create content with, with um, our member organizations and collaborate, collaborating organizations. So it's not just an academic exercise. We, we try to provide real value to the organizations that, uh, that work uh, directly with us. We also provide some training. Um, on topics related to digital transformation, technology management, innovation. Uh, and we've developed our frameworks, such as our IT capability maturity framework, which is used globally. Um, 
you know, by organizations to improve how, how they get value from, from digital technology. Um, we have you know, many publications. We have approximately 50 staff. Uh, both from the faculty in Munich University and researchers who are employed directly on research projects. And we've done many um, different assessments and, and benchmarking for organizations, uh, both in Ireland and, and globally. Just a, you know, a quick overview of some of the types of organizations that we've worked with. Um, everything from uh, you know, large multinationals, um, small to medium enterprises, startups, uh, also the public sector, um, and we work a lot with, with other uh, research organizations and um, some of the SFI centers are, are highlighted here, but also internationally, we work with, uh, with you know, quite a lot of other academic institutions and research institutions uh, worldwide. Um, this is just a quick overview of our, our research areas for uh, that uh, you may, may not be familiar, familiar with. So we, we work in a lot of different um, vertical sectors and um, from digital retail here, we can see on the left and we hear a little bit from um, Emer on on some projects there. Um, we will you know do a lot of work in digital health, and we'll hear a little bit from from Karen on that. Um, you know the public sector I mentioned, uh, GovTech. We do some in manufacturing, smart cities and regions, fintech, uh, and also one that's not represented here, but that we'll hear a bit from is is around uh, technology in, in the agricultural sector. Uh, we also have horizontal areas around digital strategy and vision. So how do organizations plan uh, how to use their technologies as they um, you know, develop their, their you know, business models and, and businesses. What capabilities are important to underpin those, the, you know, the architectures, the people, the processes, the governance, and of course, cybersecurity is quite a topical uh, area there. And then we can delve deeper into, you know, many individual uh, types of technologies, cloud computing, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and process simulation, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, whereby we leverage those individual technologies for business benefits. So typical questions that we see from organizations, and this is just at a high level, you know, we can delve into these much deeper, but you know, how can digital technologies help organizations to innovate? So th these are the types of questions we hear from the organizations that we work with. And we can kind of break that down into three main areas. So you know, how do organizations use new technologies to develop new products and service offerings? Uh, how do they better serve their existing customers and, and help them to acquire customers? And how do they make their businesses more efficient? Um, you know, using digital technologies. We hear that there's a lot of hype, you know, we hear an awful lot of hype, I guess, at, uh, at the moment about artificial intelligence. But, uh, you know, we've heard it in the past from technologies such as blockchain, um, you know, uh, AR, VR, et cetera, et cetera. But which of these new technologies are applicable to, to particular businesses and sectors? Um, you, know, you know, we can really help organizations with, with narrowing down um, the technology selection and you know where, where they can best apply those technologies within their businesses. Um, and also a key component of that then is what new skills will the employees need to implement and use these technologies? So how do you, how do you develop the skills to help organizations to, to better use those technologies? And then you know finally, you know a lot of technologies don't you know they are, you know they may have some idea where to start, but it's you know where do they re how do they really develop that uh, you know that strategy? Um, and um, a roadmap for implementation of, of these new technologies. So the main funding supports we'll, we'll talk to, uh, about today are those um, provided by, you know, the, here on, on the top two, Enterprise Ireland and Science Foundation Ireland, uh, who are the two um, Irish state uh, funding um, for, for research funding, uh, and also with the European Commission. So Enterprise Ireland provide two main funding programs that we would interact with, Innovation Vouchers, and, and these now have been uh, over the summer um, they used to be 5,000 euros per vouchers, but they're now at 10,000 euros per voucher. Uh, and an organization can apply for, for four of those, three of them fully funded, and the fourth one would have to be 50-50 funded. Then innovation partnerships, which can be up to 200,000. Um, um, uh, and you know, those were maybe would have been a more clearly defined um, program of research for, for the organization. Um, uh, um, you know, and, and those can be, uh, we, we, we've applied for those and we, we hear about one of those from, from EMA also. So from Science Foundation Ireland, there is, you know, the primarily one that we, we work with is the targeted industry projects. Um, and those can be in collaboration with the, the different centers that we, that we SFI centers that we, we work with. Um, Adapt, Lero, Connect, Future and Euro being, being some of the, the, the key ones that we've, we've worked with recently. And then finally, on the European Commission side, the main program that we leverage is the Marie Slavska Career Actions. Uh, and we'll hear about one of those in a bit more detail from uh, Erica and Lady Anne later on. 
Okay, uh, with that overview, I'll just uh, hand over to Emer. So Emer, um, Emer is uh, the Group Strategy and E-Commerce Director with Kilkenny Design. Um, I'll just stop sharing, Emer, and I'll hand over to you. Super. Thank you, Paul, and good afternoon, everyone. As Paul said, I am the Group Strategy and E-Commerce Director with Kilkenny Design. For anyone not familiar with Kilkenny Design, we are the largest art design retailer in Ireland with over 21 stores, 250 art designers and also a significant online presence um, internationally via our e-commerce website. Um, 74% of our products are Irish designed and we're also the founders of the Champion Green Movement, which is a nationwide movement to support local. So no different to many um, different sectors, retail has had its challenges, it's fair to say, over the last number of years, um, particularly post-COVID, but also the transformation of within the digital space, which really has accelerated also since COVID. And now I'm probably going to take you through a couple of areas where we identified some great opportunities, but challenges also, and how an innovation value partnership um, created value for us and helped us to create a roadmap for the future. So the first one probably to just look at is the evolution of channels. So consumers nowadays expect to access your product through so many different channels. It's not just bricks and mortar and online. It's through live selling. It's through social media platforms, etc. And the complexity within that um, appears when you're developing a strategy around your inventory management across each of these different areas, when you're looking at your marketing strategies to provide a seamless experience, and also when creating customer service across each that's seamless and um, best presents your brand to the customer. One of the other key areas that it's a big topic out there, it's big data, and again, impacts a lot of different industries, big data, big topic, great opportunity, but I'm sure anyone who works with data is very aware that it's the mining of data is the opportunity. It's the understanding of what it's telling you and how to utilize it to drive better decision making. That's the real opportunity, but also challenge in its own right, given the vast quantities of data that are coming at us on a daily basis. The next one is consumer experience. So, again, customers expect um expect to be able to access your product in lots of new and different novel ways. And it's keeping abreast of all the changes there. A great example is again, try on mirrors. Um, is it something we should look at in retail? Is it not? And again, when you look at all of these different types of um, new technologies, again, some are relevant, some are not. How do you decide which to look at and which are relevant for your industry? Um, competitors from the online world, again, so there's some significant giants out there that are paving the way with uh, delivery from drone within an hour or two. So if you're working in a sector like the SME sector where that's not something you can turn on so quickly, how do you compete with that? How do you create a seamless, fantastic experience and keep loyalty with your customers while also being able to implement a level of, of the key expectations that are out there um, driven by large um, organizations like um, Amazon, for example? And the next one then is digital technologies in general. So there's lots of technologies. It's a very fast moving sector, probably accelerated pace since COVID. So there's lots of things, Paul, you alluded to them. There's augmented reality, there's virtual reality, there's try on mirrors. The list is endless. And again, what's right for you within the sector? That was something we had to really look at. And again, when was the right time? Time is a big a big factor in this as well. Sometimes the industry or the consumer isn't ready for some of these technologies at a certain point, but they evolve and later they're willing to adapt to same. So that's a bit of a background of some of the opportunities and challenges we faced within retail. And then we embarked on an innovation partnership with IVI and with Maynooth University to look at these challenges and to create a roadmap and to identify what were the key, key areas we could focus on to take advantage of these changes for our business. So the first one I'm going to touch on here is the Kilkenny Virtual Reality Store. So we launched this in conjunction with IVI and Maynooth in July 2021. The next slide gives you a little snapshot of what that looks like. So it allowed you to shop our NASA Street store from the comfort of your own home. And the timing here was was actually perfect. Again, was the customer ready? Not very, not very much uh, tuned to virtual reality, I would say, um, for our age profile customer. But having said that, because they were in a world where COVID didn't facilitate them going into store and where they were nervous to go into store because of all the um, changes in the environment, they adapted to a virtual reality store. And 
from our perspective, it also worked very well for our international customers who at the time were not traveling back to Ireland and it provided them with a great experience by being able to shop NASA Street, our flagship, and to learn about each of the products, to pick them up, to add them to cart. So what did that do for Kilkenny? Well, for us, we were the leaders in VR adoption from a retail perspective as we had add to cart functionality. So that was, um, it won, uh, I think, an award around that as well at the time. And it provided us with great insight into consumer preferences. Again, because they were shopping from their home, they were engaging with the products. We could understand their navigation and how they moved around the store. And we saw some very strong metrics from same. So again, a great time, I must say, to adopt virtual reality and um, would not have been possible without an innovation partnership and um, because of the risk um, in investing in this type of project and also because of the resources that we wouldn't have had within our group um, as part of SME sector. One of the other key areas we focused on is the data. And look, we're all aware that data is gold, but it has to be used in the right way to drive a better experience for the customer and um, to set the company up in a and to put the company in a position where you're developing products, services, et cetera, that are what the customer is going to want and will need into the future. So how did IVI help us with this? Well, we embarked on a project identifying all the data sources. So there's a lot of data sources um, within any company um, um, and lots of different sources of information on our customers, etc. And we looked at what was the best means through which to store that data, how to put it all together into a lake, and then how to pave a roadmap for developing it into an analytics platform that could continue to evolve with all the key changes um, that are um, happening within the sector and the changes for consumer preferences. So here's a little snapshot of what that platform looked like um, when it was developed. Again, it was not a lot of novel techniques were deployed at the time on this, and it, the aim was to provide a 360 view of the customer. So it's it's still a work in progress from our perspective. We continue to evolve and develop it, but it certainly gave us a fantastic foundation from which to um, drive forward with data analytics, which is a space that will continue to add value to any company as well as um, any customer journey. So in summary, from our perspective, the innovation partnership produced some fantastic results. It allowed us to um, embark on digital transformation uh, much faster than what would have been possible without it. It increased our innovation capacity and culture. It provided us to resources and capabilities. It accelerated our time to market with the virtual reality store, which is not something that we would have been able to do without it. It reduced our risk and mitigated our financial risk because of the sharing of resources and financials. And again, it provided us with access to new customers. So for anyone out there that's looking at maybe new opportunities, new services, new products, or just something they want to explore, I think it's a fantastic opportunity to collaborate, to share and pool resources and share risk. So that again, you're looking at, I suppose, developing um, what's the right result for you and your company. And, you know, it's giving you access to more that you wouldn't have access to otherwise. So um, fantastic result overall. And on that note, I'd like to hand you back to Paul. Thank you, Paul. It's great. Thanks very much, Emer. Uh, great to hear uh, that success story, and you know, I think it's, it's very impressive. And I, you know, I think we've continued to to grow the relationship, and, and we're looking at, at new opportunities uh, for funding on, on the back of that. But thanks very much, uh, Emer, for for sharing that. Um, John, I'd like to hand over to you now. So, um, you know, John is a chief technologist at um, IDA Ireland. Uh, so, John, uh, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about the. Um, the trends you're seeing at, at IDA and, and how you're supporting the, the multinational sector here in Ireland. Lovely. Thank you very much, Paul, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so I'm just going to share out a little slide to start. Uh, so a little bit of background. My I'm John Dern, Chief Technologist, as Paul had said here within IT Ireland. I work a lot with all the companies in the technology sector. So we see quite a lot of change, as you can imagine, in, in the in areas of research and development at the moment. Um, so just to kind of give a little bit of an outline around IDA and where we're currently at, I suppose, as you can see, 35 billion is done through the Irish economy in terms of there. But one key figure I'll point out is over on the right-hand side, where we have 300,000 now employed directly through FDI within Ireland and a total of about 1,000, just over 1,800 companies. Out of that, roughly 50% that equates to technology companies. So it's a good indicator to do well of just how, as Ireland has modernised over the 
over the last 20 years with a particularly focus of, of tech companies coming in. Uh, and you can see kind of a, a good snapshot of that here where we're breaking it down in terms of the context here with uh, the job br breakdown there. So I, information communication or technologies, financial services, modern manufacturing we're seeing there as well, and then also then traditional manufacturing. Um, a modern manufacturing, a lot of this is on the, the med tech sector, for example, is a growing area that's in there. And, and smart devices and so on is, is kind of a change in the demographics. And all of this gives opportunities for R&D. Um, one thing I'd just like to show you here too as well, just kind of a trend. So we talked about kind of the the total employment at the moment is over th three hundred thousand, and and if you look at that, it's for the last uh, twenty year last last um, ten to fifteen years, it's been gradually extending up. Now, what has been very interesting is in the last, I suppose, three or four years in particular, this growth has been around research and development. So initially, we would have seen quite a lot of companies setting up their sales and operations teams out in Ireland. But what we've seen over the last while, in particular now, is companies coming in doing R&D. And sometimes their first move into Ireland is to do research and development here within that context. And that's driven through the high opportunity of skills, also the opportunity for collaborations with the university sector in particular, and also with, with the ease of access for having talent here and also from bringing talent into Ireland on that side. So that's just kind of just give a little context, this was of the of the Irish market at the at the moment. So what I'm just going to do now is just kind of talk a little bit about some of the trends that we have seen, in particular the, the FDI companies that, that we've worked with within that. So as you've seen, research and development is, is a growing factor within the FDI sector. And we're seeing that across every element of it. As you can imagine, generative AI at the moment is very much a, a key trend that comes into that. But also if we look at, say, for example, our medical technologies sector, we're looking at life sciences, we're looking at engineering, you're starting to see a very much a growing interest in the whole idea of connected devices, edge AI, et cetera, around that. But out of that then obviously comes the big challenge around data governance and, and also that understanding around what does this mean in terms of context for upskilling of staff as well. So we're seeing a bigger demand as well and growing for training. De training demands is coming out of the companies. And with that then comes this understanding of digital transformation. So when you look at the traditional sectors in engineering and in life sciences and in, in, in medical devices, they traditionally were developing uh, products. So say medical devices was, a, let's call it a simple product. It did a very specific task and it did it very well. Now they're looking at the opportunities of making these kind of smart devices getting data off that and then integrating that into other systems. So into your app on your phone or et cetera. But all, so all of this is leading to many of these companies themselves internally have to look at digital transformation and what does that mean and the opportunities for skills and transformation for them. And we're in IDA, we're working with companies on this through a different series of training programs. And we're also encouraging companies to reach out very much to the third level institutes who can engage in that way. IVI being such a good example of, from that area that's there. We're also seeing a really strong focus now, particularly with the EU AI Act, on data governance and AI governance. And this is going to become a really core part for businesses going forward. What this has also tended to driven is that there's now uh, an increasing demand of looking for PhD candidates, either at a postgrad or undertaking their PhDs at the moment, to be engaged in the R&D. And this has mainly come from two factors and that's driven this. So one is the companies in Ireland have been moving up the value chain in terms of their R&D over the last number of years. And then two, because they are because the technology field, as Eber mentioned there earlier, is rapidly changing with so much things coming on board. It's very important to have a key number of people within your team who've got deep understanding of some of the fundamental technologies that are going to be shaping this future, because that fundamental knowledge is what's going to help those companies adapt as they start adapting these technologies and understanding ways in which they can interact together. So within that, we have seen, for example, IBM have done a partnership with Trinity uh, recently looking at the idea of having a cohort of PhD students in the world of AI and quantum.
And that is kind of an industry collaboration piece that's coming. And we've seen other companies such as Workday have done something similar with, with uh, TU Dublin. And this is kind of a growing trend we're starting to see now where the multinationals are really focused in on opportunities with collaborations across the university sector. And we're seeing this right across the board. And for example, we had there as well, it was mentioned at the start with Lero, we had recently where Qualcomm have announced that they're doing a partnership within Lero and doing some of that research just there. So what we're starting to see is that the value add within the FDI sector is moving more to a collaboration piece on future skill needs. And that's a trend that's growing. And that's been driven by the increased R&D that's happening within the FDI sector. It's also been driven by the rapid adoption of technologies within that sector. And so, for example, in my area where I look after technology, which is enterprise SaaS and semiconductors, they're rapidly changing. There's new areas of research there in material science, but also on the enterprise SaaS side of products, we're looking at behavioral, sci behavioral science and companies and managing change because those products are used within companies in relation to how does that impact on their day-to-day -day usage and, and productivity gains as well. So it's a very interesting dynamic at the moment where you would have traditionally software companies developing software for particular niches, but now through generative AI and into agents, and as that further develops down the road, this whole idea of kind of a multidisciplinary teams are starting to come together. So for example, you're starting to see legal people mixed in with psychologists, mixed in with data scientists, mixed in with PhD researchers, and across multiple domains. And I think that's a trend that we're going to see that's going, it's, start, it's started now, and we're expecting to see that grow. So as that grows, that is a huge opportunity for many of the FTI companies to really engage within the, the research community here in Ireland. And that has had a very, very strong backing from what we've seen with so many of our clients having very positive experiences to date. One of the big positive things that we have seen, and many of the FTI companies have said that, is that one thing that Ireland does exceptionally well is engages with FTI companies and in round tailored programs and being able as well to do on the research side, but equally in designing new course content for the emerging technologies. So that I think is, again, is a really nice, strong signal from that side. And within IDA, that's one of our key driver factors is to work within the FDI and encourage further inter interactions between the university sectors. And it's a real key indicator for us in how we can drive that and, and support it in any ways. And then on that side, for, for any FDI, FDI companies looking at this, they're all available through the Innovation Partnership Programme, which was mentioned earlier. That's equally available to, to uh, IDA clients. And so we're very active on that side. We also support through a range of R&D support through feasibilities for, for kind of testing out new ideas and also through the, um, our main R&D grant, which is kind of funding for any research and development programs you're looking at. And through that, there's the option of doing contractual research where you can actually involve a research institute as part of your R&D project. And those costs are eligible under the main R&D program. And again, we've seen some of the companies uh, looking at and uh, have availed of this in the past. So broadly, I'd just like to wrap up and say that from IDA's perspective, we are very much engaging with the opportunities of collaboration in this in the broadly and evolving world for technologies and for R and D. And we also are looking for companies who are looking on that digital transformation journey to come to us as well because we have training supports and we're looking at other options as the future around digital transformation. So thank you all, and I hope every um has a nice afternoon. I'll put back to you now, Paul. Thanks, John. No, it's great to hear that uh, that big picture. Um, you know, in terms of what's going on, uh, uh from IDA's perspective in, in Ireland, and I think that aligns a lot. Um, you know, in terms of that knowledge transfer piece, you know, so from research to to education and training programs, I think it's it's really important to see it as a, as a continuum. Um, you know, along those in terms of knowledge transfer for 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 companies. Uh, so now I'd like to hand over to to Karen Kelly, who's a CEO of Panacea Flow. And we're going to hear about um, Karen's innovation journey in, you know, in developing uh, her business idea um, and how uh, IVI has supported her through that journey. Over to you, Karen. Thanks, Paul. Hi, as Paul says, my name is Karen Kelly. I'm um, an ANP in heart failure. 
um, and the CEO of Panacea Flow. Um, I'm very passionate about cardiovascular disease, but actually catching it at an early stage. So about trying to catch early disease and trying to empower people with the education, knowledge and tools to try and actually avoid cardiovascular and metabolic disease, because I think it's the only way that we're going to actually help our health service and help the situation that we're in at the moment. So, sorry, Paul, can't seem to get this. Um, so why innovation vectors? Well, I am a nurse. I'm not a business person, and I'm certainly not, as Rajesh and his team know, I'm certainly not a technology person. But I have, over the last few years, realized that digital tools can really augment clinical practice. So when it's put with clinical practice, it can really help to get out to more people and to really help clinical practice. So I wanted to look at reducing the incidence of cardiovascular disease by combining digital technology with cl clinical knowledge, risk assessment tools and evidence-based guidelines. So all of this information is out there, but it's all on different platforms. And you nearly need a degree to actually manage to figure out every single part of it. And you also need loads of time. So it's to put it all together in a way that it's readily accessible easily accept accessible and that it actually is there at the touch of a, 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 a touch of a finger. Um, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death globally. 80% of it is preventable in the under 65 year, year olds and 1.7 billion of our Irish health care budget is currently spent on treating cardiovascular disease. There is loads of tools available, but if we keep going the way we are, we don't have enough staff, we don't have enough people, and those people that we do have don't have enough time to actually treat what we have. So we need to just um, encourage more adherence to guidelines. And I just met with the team um, and we've had, a, I, I think, a fantastic few months. Met with the team in March um, and initially they all told me that I had massive ideas and they reined me in a little bit and we sat down and we actually looked at realistic goal settings for our first voucher stages, which was um, a really good meeting. We applied for the voucher back in March and the IBI team, it was my first time even applying for anything like this. So they even helped me actually with the application form. The whole process has been quite agile and it's changed throughout even over the few months. Um, they, we, they initially went off and we sat down and I said, this is what I want to do. I um, didn't even know if anybody else was doing it. So they went off, they did a lit review on what I was looking at. They looked at research around business model development. We did feasibility studies and um, had ongoing discussions back and forth about technical roadmaps, workflows and prototypes for a project. Product. I've learned loads, even about different technologies and stuff. Then got a, a focus group together of um, a couple of different advanced nurse practitioners from different areas of chronic disease and out in GP practice, some people who would possibly use non use the tool, both non-clinical and clinical, so even potential patients. Um, and we put the, the IVI team put together um, a VVOX where they had an interactive session with multiple choice and other types of questions. We did a 90 minute session of data gathering and questionnaires um, which was the aim of it and, and what happened at the outcome was it was validating the assessment variables for the flat platform um, and they were all taken into consideration for the prototype design. It was a very interesting day. Um, and then afterwards, then we, we I actually got to see Figma designs and prototypes and it actually started to look and feel quite real. It was quite exciting. It was been a very steep learning curve. The team have been very supportive. Um, they've integrated the parameters from the focus group into the prototype. I've learned so many new words and technology um, from all of the development and the, the, the different meetings through all of this. I actually ended up also doing a pre-tech accelerator course. Never thought as a nurse I'd be doing a pre-tech accelerator course with merits. Um, from the design and from what we've done with the um, IBI vouchers. I won that course and I've actually now been supported by Merits as well in looking at a business model and I've got one-to-one -one, um, mentoring 
mentoring sessions with Merits. We've now rebranded the company and they're, they're the logos that are up there. And the company is now called Heart Paths because they all felt Panacea Flow didn't say what it actually did, um, which I think is great. We're now looking at the second voucher and um, just had the lately had the last discussion with the IBI team and Rajet and Sam. And we're looking at refining the business model, identifying and building on possible collaborations that I've made over the last few months and looking at revenue streams and um, providing AI roadmaps. So continuing to explore algorithms that we've already explored in Voucher One and building on strategies to incorporate them into ecosystems, refining the prototype and adding additional markers um, and, and to revisit the whole focus group again to reevaluate what we've already done. I'm really looking forward to getting stuck into it. It's been an amazing um, few months and it's been a great journey. So I can't wait to keep going on it. And um, so thank you very much. Back to you, Paul. Fantastic, Karen. Thanks, Mayan. And um, so I, I think that's a, a really great example of, of you know, um, kind of some of the key things that we like to focus on in IDI, you know, not just focusing on technology for technology's sake, but also looking at the, at the business outcomes and, and you know, focusing on um, uh, the, the user as well at the heart of, of those outcomes. So really understanding what, what the what the user wants. And it's a fantastic product. And we're really, we're really looking forward to uh, to working uh, closely with you, Karen, on, on, on the second voucher. So thanks very much for that. Okay, so um, next up, um, we have Erica and Lady Anne, um, who are both PhD students working on the Entrust um, uh, project. So that this is a, a large um, multi-million euro um, project uh, funded by the Marie curie Slowska uh, action from the European uh, Commission. Marcus, uh, our director, is the, uh, the the main coordinator for this, and we have um, many different uh, partners all over Europe. Um, but to give you more detail on, on the project and, and what Lady Anne and, and Erica are working on, I'll, I'll hand you over to, to those two as the experts of the project. Good afternoon, everyone. I will share my screen. Okay, so I will talk a little bit about the Intrust project. So my name is Erika Tagolo, and today with my colleague Lena Da Silva, we will show uh, about the Intrust project, which is a Marie Curie doctoral network. Uh, so in the um, doctoral network, we are 11 doctoral candidates, uh, and the main aim of the Intrust is to train a, a cohort of 11 doctoral candidates to produce a new generation of data executives uh, who will be able to advance the state of the art in data sharing, specifically in agriculture, in a fair, um, transparent, and trusted environment. Uh, so it's a joint doctorate, meaning uh, it's international, intersectoral, and interdisciplinary um, PhD. Uh, why international? Mm, we have five countries in the project, uh, and it comprises the awarding institution, host organization, the trainings event, uh, which we have every six months, and the segments as well. Um, why intersectoral, you might wonder. Um, and like the countries, we are part of in the project, we have Ireland, of course, uh, Italy, Greece, Sweden, and Switzerland as well. Um, so why intersectoral? As you can see from the different working packages, we have digital technology adoption, data governance practices, and also innovative business models. And as part uh, um, of the partners in the project, we have both universities and uh, so both the academia and the industry. And in the next slide, I will show you the different partners that are part of the project. And why intersectoral? disciplinary because in comprehends like different disciplines uh, we have people coming from the IT background from the school of business and so on um, so the um, overall goal of the interest project is to demonstrate how agriculture and forestry data from farmers can be made available govern and utilized with benefits shared in a fair way not just towards the farmers, but also towards the agri-tech businesses and the uh, main stakeholders that are part of the agricultural data ecosystem. Uh, 
Um, so as I mentioned, we have a different trust consortium partners. Uh, we have five different university. We have Manuth University, uh, which I'm, I'm part of, um, as well as Ladian. We also have the Agricultural University of Athens in Greece. Uh, we have the University of St. Galen in Switzerland. Um, we also have the Neos University in Sweden and the University of Palermo in Italy. Um, the other partners are the companies, like for example, we have Sodra in Sweden and Interior Cluster and HL Design. Here in Ireland, we also have the Wheel, Agro Apps, Airfield, and Chagask. Uh, I'm also um, a full time employee in Chagask, which is the Agriculture and Food Development Authority. And my colleague, Ladian, she is part of Airfield Estate. And I give the word to her so she can tell a little bit uh, more about Airfield Estate and about herself. Okay. Hi everyone, thank you very much. So in this pro in this project, like Erica said, I'm hosted by Airfield State, which is a urban farm and gardens based in Dundrum. And its goal is to become the uh, Dublin Sustainable Food Hub. And here we have like people from several different backgrounds. I'm working at the Education and Research Office. But unfortunately, we don't have anyone related to technology or that. We have people with expertise in sustainability and in nutrition. So to overcome this gap, I am the first PhD of our field that is working with agricultural data since uh, nowadays everyone needs to become much more data driven. So I am going to work towards that. So in the end, both of us will be able to learn a lot about dealing with data. So maybe, can you move to the next slide, Erica, please? Okay, so through this uh, project, we, we attend several events, not only in Ireland, but also at the European level. And in those events, we are also representing our organization. So it means that uh, we are also creating a network that will to find new potential collaborations, not only for ourselves, but it will also help the organizations. And uh, in these events, since we have uh, several different partners, we have the opportunity to attend their events. For example, Erica, she attended the Harvest Festival in her field state, and I joined the Beef Conference 2024 at the Chagas, and it's the same like uh, with other project partners. So I can talk a little bit about my research background on the next slide, please. So regarding my background, I, do, uh, I lived in several different countries. I felt that uh, I needed to learn more about that. And in my working experience in those different countries and the companies, I wasn't really dealing with that. So I did my master's, but it, unfortunately it was during the time of the COVID and it uh, uh, somehow affects the learning. And then after I finished that, I felt that I still needed to learn much more about data. And I heard about this great opportunity to mix like uh, the academia and the industry through the project and trust, which is fully funded by the Europe. So I thought it would be um, an amazing opportunity. So I applied for that and here I am. So I started my position last year in October, and I'm dealing with the techniques to ensure data quality and the trustworthiness of AgriData. And I'm guided by industry and academic supervisors. And for example, from the industry, I have insights from the agricultural perspective and from the, in, from the academia and also the IVI, I have learning a lot. I'm learning a lot about the data perspectives so I am guided by different uh, supervisors. And then I will pass now to my colleague, Erica, so she can also explain her background. Thanks, Lydian. Um, So um, about my academic background, I'm originally Italian. So I have my bachelor in, from the University of the State of Palermo and my master at IA Bordeaux in France. As working experience, I started originally from the HR department in Lithuania while I was doing Erasmus there. And then I had like some experience in uh, Malaysia remotely because it was during COVID time uh, to, and I was working for uh, an IT software company. And and lastly, I was working for the audit team in Deloitte before joining the PhD. Uh, so what motivated me the most to apply for this type of PhD, the Marie Curie one, was first of all, the prestige of the Marie Curie. It's a well-known uh, PhD scholarship, one of the most prestigious. Um, and like also the 
uh, intersectorality of the um, of the project. Uh, as lady, I'm, I'm part of the Manuf University. It is the, my awarding institution, and my host organization is Chagask. So I have also the opportunity to have the um, practitioner perspective. Um, so like from the University of Manuf, I'm taking like the, the theory part, how to develop and to structure my research. And in Chagask, I'm putting in practice what I am learning. Um, and also the internationality of the PhD, um, we are we have like our partners from five different countries, but also within the project, like the eleven extra candidates, we are for we are from all over the world, uh, and also the agricultural sector. Let's say it's a hot topic in the last years. Uh, the digital transformation is definitely hitting also this sector. Uh, so I felt the need to join like to, to join this as well uh, and in my case i'm taking care of developing a framework on trust and fair rb data share principles and the fair principles state for uh findable accessible interoperable and reusable when it comes to agricultural data so thanks for your attention and i leave the word to paul that's great <clears throat> thanks very much erica lady Anne. I think it's um you know a great example of a you know a, an international project so European wide, um but also you know touches on those topics that that uh, that John spoke about in terms of having PhD students at the heart of um you know the, the companies and organizations um you know research uh, research programs, um but also I guess another thing to point out about it is that it involves public sector as well as companies uh, and the universities um you know working together. Um, to to solve these uh, you know uh, big challenges um, that we see in, in in many different sectors in in this case the the agricultural sector. Um, so now uh, we'll hand over to uh, Rajat, um, who's our program manager for um, our rethink redesign program, which uh, leverages the you know primarily the innovation vouchers but other programs. Um, and Rajat's going to talk a little bit about you know what we've done to date. You know um, you know working with, with about 30 companies. Um, so Rajat, over to you. Yep. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Rajat, and I manage the... Uh, let me just share my screen. Yeah, so I manage the Rethink Redesign program. And uh, uh, two key funding tools under this uh, program are uh, innovation vouchers and innovation partnerships. So innovation vouchers are uh, funding worth 10,000 euros from Enterprise Island to assist a company explore a business opportunity or problem with a registered knowledge provider such as ourselves. So the aim of the scheme is to increase interaction between uh, publicly funded research and SMEs in Ireland. And all SMEs, uh, limited companies in all sectors of Irish economy are eligible to apply. So the maximum funding for one SME uh, is a maximum of four vouchers that amounts to 40,000 euros uh, three of these vouchers have to be uh, standard vouchers and one must be a 50-50 co-funded vouchers. So the permitted uses for these vouchers are uh, new model, business model development, uh, new service delivery and customer interface, uh, tailored training in innovation management, innovation technology audit, new service development, new product or process development. Some of the activities that we can't undertake are uh, software development, market research. Uh, so coming to the eligibility and uh, application process. So all SMEs uh, which have uh, technically full-time employees in the company less than 250 and have an annual turnover not exceeding 50 million or an annual balance sheet not exceeding 43 million. The exclusion is agricultural sector because they have their own support and companies that have been approved in excess of 3,000 euros uh, funding from Enterprise Island in the previous five years cannot go for a standard voucher, although they can avail a co-funded voucher. So the uh, application process uh, starts with us uh, drafting uh, an application draft uh, basis the preliminary meeting that we have. And then... Uh, uh, then the application is submitted on the EI online portal. Uh, after this, it takes around three to four weeks for EI to either approve or reject the voucher. And uh, then we start with the project activities, which is followed by the prototype or the project handover. Then the voucher redemption takes place. And then, then only we can start with voucher two. Uh, it's key to note that uh, we can only have one voucher active at, at a time. 
So this is a suggested process and a four voucher potential. Uh, coming to the suggested process, uh, it starts with a design thinking workshop wherein we uh, diverge and then converge on both pain points and potential solutions. The methodology that we deploy is agile targeted research, which is around best practices, industry trends, case studies, uh, leading to refined solutions and enabled by regular meetings. The final output that we deliver is in the form of innovation, uh, process, skills, and technology roadmaps. Uh, I'll talk about the four voucher potential. So we believe in uh, longer engagements and deriving, uh, maximize, uh, deriving maximum innovative value from the engagement. So uh, it starts with the, the concept development, then we have the first voucher around concept feasibility, second around solution design, and third and fourth uh, subsequently about, around uh, POC implementation. So as you can see, uh, the three of them are 10K worth each, 100% funded by Enterprise Island. The last one has to be 50% funded. So in total, you get 40K worth uh, academic expertise, and there's an early exit deliverable uh, after each of the first three uh, vouchers. Uh, coming to the Innovation Partnership Program, which is a la larger funding uh, scheme around industry academia collaboration. So this is a collaborative innovation that encourages Irish-based companies to collaborate with uh, research institutes to drive innovation and commercialize new technologies. So this program supports uh, projects that involve industrial research or experimental development. So AI provides up to 80% of the research costs with funding available up to 200,000 euros. So the companies get access to cutting edge research and expertise and the program uh, uh, aims to enhance the economic impact in Ireland by supporting projects uh, that deliver tangible commercial benefits and foster sustainable growth. So there are cycles to the proposal being uh, submitted and the IRCC is the body that eventually uh, approves or rejects it. So in 2024, like in, we only have one cycle remaining wherein like we have to submit the uh, full proposal before 29th October and we'll hear the result uh, of the proposal uh, before uh, 12th December. So coming to the uh, eligibility and application process around innovation partnerships, uh, the companies must be based in Republic of Ireland and engage in manufacturing or international traded services. Uh, they must have a defined uh, operational base within the country. Uh, they have to be registered clients of one of Ireland's state development agencies, uh, such as Enterprise Island, IDA, or LEO. Uh, high potential startups can also participate in IPP, but uh, funding is generally capped at uh, 100,000 euros. Uh, companies can participate in multiple IPP projects, but uh, not more than two projects can be underway at the same time. Uh, coming to the application process, there is a pre-application phase wherein the companies need to interact with their development advisor as well as the uh, PIs from the research institutes. And then there are two pathways. They can either go with an innovation partnership outline proposal, or they can go with a uh, idea feasibility study, which is funded by Enterprise Island up to 9,000 euros. And basis that, uh, they uh, uh, submit a full proposal, which is eventually evaluated and approved by IRCC and uh, leading to the project setup. Uh, so there are uh, 36 knowledge providers that uh, uh, the industry can team up with. So why IBI? So I'll, I'll uh, give you a short profile uh, around the Institute. Uh, it was established in 2006 as a collaboration between Minot University and Intel. It's a leading internationally connected center for multidisciplinary research on digital transformation. Uh, we are instrumental in developing capability-driven digital transformation paths. We have strong industry collaboration within an international, intersectoral, and interdisciplinary setting. We have a range of industry engagement, innovation activities, and funding diversities. And like Paul mentioned, we have research clusters as many real-world examples, uh, real-world ecosystems such as digital retail, digital health, GovTech, manufacturing, FinTech. So coming to what we have done so far, uh, we have worked and are still working on uh, in total 30 innovation vouchers. 26 of them have been completed and four are currently active. We focus on digital transformation and innovation topics. We have assisted clients enhance operational efficiencies, acquire new customers and develop new products and offerings. 
We've helped clients redefine uh, refine digital business models, processes, and assisted organizations with technical innovation roadmaps and digital strategy. A completion rate is 100%. The voucher completion time typically is 8 to 12 weeks for us. Uh, I'll end up with some key activities and outcomes around these projects and the sectoral share of the projects we have undertaken so far. So you can see digital health occupies the key share. Uh, it's around 20% of our total projects. Uh, other key sectors are software and IT services, retail, HR and recruitment consulting, and technical and industrial services. Some of the activities that we undertake are design thinking workshops, uh, feasibility studies, uh, we conduct research around business model development. Uh, we conduct scientific research, lit reviews, and we also uh, uh, conduct technical assessments. The outcomes, uh, the tangible outcomes are POCs and prototypes. We also, uh, uh, as an output, we also have uh, technology roadmaps, innovation roadmaps, as well as AI roadmaps. So I'll end with this and uh, I'll also share the coordinates uh, for any queries regarding the business support uh, or the program. Uh, and I'll hand it back to Paul. Thanks, Raja. And it's uh, yeah, it's great, great to get that overview of all the different uh, different projects that, that have been done in, you know, in different sectors, different types of companies. Um, and yeah, thanks for, for leading the program over the last uh, six months and, and really scaling it. So we're we're really encouraging organizations to come and engage with us because we think it's a fantastic support, the innovation vouchers, and a way to really, uh, in a very low risk way, engage with um you know a, an academic institution, a research institution such as ourselves, to, and get real tangible outcomes um to to develop your your um your your business ideas. So well, thanks, Roger. So uh, finally, um I'll hand over to uh, Professor Marcus Hel Helford, our director at IDI. Uh, to say a few words about uh, maybe other other um, you know topics that we, we haven't covered today in terms of research supports and and the different projects that we can we can involve companies in. Right. Thanks, Paul. And first, before we talk about funding, I just want to say thanks to all the presenters. It's a fantastic webinar. All the different topics and also I think the different solutions. Uh, and way forward on digital transformation. I think uh, that's just fantastic examples also, working with academia, working with industry, working in that collaborative way, what we actually can do if we really work together on solving the problems, learning, uh, guidance. Um, so these examples really show benefits, which benefits for all. And I think Paul, on the beginning, you said IVI is there to provide real value to organizations. Would say we provide real value, innovation, so that innovation value part in our name is um, we make that real. Uh, we try to innovate, we try to create solutions together and providing value, providing value to organizations, but also to young researchers, Ladian and Erika uh, explained some parts of this on their journey on a PhD, but also of course for academia. So research results, uh, knowledge, knowledge sharing is really important also from an academic side, but also as an example show, uh, value in product services, service innovation, and learning for teams, basically, and immersing in the real world and really providing this for, for Ireland. Sean, you mentioned some of the key figures for the foreign direct investment. So, and companies are here because research collaboration works. They benefit from it, for benefit from the Irish um, environment. And I think we are in a fantastic time as well, where we have data plenty of data where we have technologies. AI is one example. We, a virtual reality, Emo, you mentioned that. It's another one, Karen, you mentioned what in medical uh, uh, terms uh, technology can do. So I think we have data, we have technology. So in IVI, we call that digital and tech uh, and, and data, and we're working on that and trying to shape roadmaps, helping along this. So uh, Rajat, you mentioned the digital transformation path. So where we learn from one project to the next, 
next one. So what worked? What is good? What are the ingredients? What organizations need to change? What they need to focus on? And really learning on prioritization along these digital transformation paths. Because I think even across sectors like IBI is in many sectors, ACRI, uh, health, uh, construction. And I think we can learn from each of the, the, the sectors how we really transform. What are the key parameters to really make that digital transformation uh, successful? And I think uh, in addition to digital and data, the skills is really important. Uh, so to have the right talent and also upskilling and things have changed, of course. Uh, so uh, job roles, professions, uh, different professions actually emerging. We're talking about data executives who can lead change, who can lead these uh, data journeys and, and really exploiting the data opportunities. So we need these professions and we need the skills on all the different levels, bachelor degree, but also PhD, professions, leaders, managers. And I think there's endless of, of, of um, opportunities, learning, ways to look at this and making it better, basically. And uh, that's kind of also what IBI, what the academic sector can provide, helping with, with the skills development in conjunction, of course, with the non-academic sector, with, with industry. Um, so, uh, and that kind of collaboration and multidisciplinarity, particular Lady and Erica, but I think others mentioned that as well, bringing that together in the right way. That's, I think, is a key one where basically uh, the research has changed, where we bring consortia together, where we bring the right people together. And for example, the innovation vouchers are a nice way, a good way, uh, a first step to bring academics, industry, researchers together and starting to shape a transformation path. Then, Emil, you mentioned the innovation partnership, where we scaled that a little bit up on this, where we worked longer term. On, on a digital transformation project. And then we also brought the team from Kilkenny Group and then uh, IVI research, Manofi University researchers together for a certain time. And they worked uh, frequently and, 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 and ongoing on the project and, and basically innovated during the project on this and made a solution for, uh, uh, for the particular aspect what you mentioned. So I think this kind of engagement model, that's what, what the key is. So, and I know Paul, I haven't mentioned anything about funding so far because I think the engagement model is the first kind of really important thing. Funding we will manage somewhere, but I think if we set it up in the right way, so if we scope the problem right, the project at the right scale from innovation voucher, innovation partnerships, targeted projects, and maybe multi um, 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 uh, uh, bigger projects, European projects. So the scale we can do, and then we think about funding and the funding we will manage uh, in, in that way uh, because there are also loads of funding opportunities. So starting innovation vouchers, 10,000 euros, uh, a doable project, a scope project, innovation partnerships, uh, uh, discussed with the industry partner, with Enterprise Ireland or IDA. Uh, and then, of course, uh, larger projects like Marie Curie, multinational projects, uh, also Horizon Europe. There are many opportunities within that. And of course, we have a, a, a European network. We can bring companies, organizations within that, uh, within a, a consortium, uh, and working also then across public, private sector to larger projects, target projects, the limit, uh, the, the problem, or the the, the 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 problem, the challenge copes the how how large such a targeted project should be. So, uh, but I think that's a step. Then, when we have identified the engagement model, the problem, and then the funding opportunities are there. Um, so, again, summarizing that, it's a fantastic time to do research to really get to the next step, to the next maturity level of digital and transform uh, digital and data. Data is there, technology is there, and we will find the funding somewhere uh, to do the, the project and uh, the skills, the people, uh, that aspect where on the end it comes to that we basically have a, a, a group, a consortium, people working together and shaping this, co-creating the next solution. So I'm very optimistic about this. I'm excited about the opportunities uh, and with IVI and the partners, our members, uh, uh, the, the organizations we're working with, uh, that, that's a fantastic community. And we have loads of other events as well, the webinars. We have, for example, our annual uh, summit in June, the IVI summit, which is a, a way to engage, innovate. We have also uh, coffee talks um, and companies, organizations who would like to start that journey with us, drop us an email or call to IVI, to Manoeuvre University for a coffee. We're talking about the, 
the, the challenge, the, 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 the opportunities there. And that's typically the first step. And then we can shape a project. If it works for everyone, there's no need to do projects if it's not beneficial for everyone. But I think the first step, drop an email or come over for a coffee. That's uh, what what's counts. So thanks. I stop here. And I didn't have any slides, uh, but we had fantastic slides and great presentation. So uh, this was really good. And I'm looking forward now to a few questions and a bit of discussions. And I hand over to Paul. Thanks, Marcus. Yeah, that's a that's a great summary and, and a great summary of of um uh you know to focus on what the business outcome is and and the engagement with the companies rather than just the, the funding. We can find funding from many different sources, but yeah, the 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 engagement and the outcomes for the companies is, is really what's important. Uh so yeah, I'll just I'll open it up to our to our attendees online if anybody wants to to ask a question. Um, please feel free to use either the chat feature or the Q and A feature on the the bottom bar uh, of Zoom to to ask any questions you might have. Um, maybe just to get things going. Um, so you know, I think one of the key things that uh, came across in 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 all the presentations uh, and across the you know the whole webinar was the um, the key of um you know dis interdisciplinarity. Um, you know, in in uh, digital transformation projects, um, you know, I think that was that kind of came across, and that's it's a, a you know a recognition that it's it's not about technology first; it's about um, you know solving real real problems. The technology is is definitely key, but we have to all work together within organizations and um, with different disciplines to to solve these. Maybe Emer, could I get you to comment on that in terms of with Kilkenny Design? How 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 important do you feel that is within your organization? Sure. Um, Paul, I guess, again, back to your point there, we're not technologists within Kilkenny Design. And um, my background is finance, actually, I'm a chartered accountant. So and I'm now head of the e-commerce business. So, again, a very different road. And I think we we have a lot of mix of different types of um, skills and backgrounds, etc. But we're, we were also quite clear then on where we had gaps from a technology perspective and also where we had gaps from a research perspective, because even if you have lots of different experts, even within legal, et cetera, within your own business, there's still lots of gaps in terms of research. So it was absolutely fundamental to sit down and do, I suppose, create a drawing board of the issues and opportunities and challenges and then develop a roadmap from same and identifying and pooling the resources that were best placed from IVI and Maynooth and then from our own company as well, because it is it's a lot of different skill sets. I think, John, you touched on that really well as well. It's it's everyone in a room because there's so many different implications to every decision that we make. It's not just about the technology, which is the enabler. It's about what are you trying to solve and have you considered everything from financial, from legal risk, from data risk, for what the consumer wants, and then the technology makes it happen. So um, it's a lot of skill sets that are required. So it absolutely, for me, is a no-brainer that collaborating with institutions like yourselves is fundamental to be able to stay ahead and to be able to develop a roadmap that makes sense because it's too... Uh, it's evolving too fast to um, assume that all those skills are in any one place at any one time. You have to reach out and work together to create that. Um, I hope that answers the question, Paul. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks very much, Emer. No, John, would you like to expand on that? I know you did touch it on in your presentation and thing, but um, maybe you could just you know highlight the importance and what and how you see that you know um, manifesting itself in the organisations that you work with. Yeah, no, no, definitely. I, I think the, the whole multidisciplinary piece coming across and with the the rapid acceleration of digital now across all sectors is is a really a big change. And like Azima said there, describe herself like, you know, she's been involved in having to understand the digital piece within that and how that is as a component and how it fits together right across the business and we're seeing that with large fti companies as well i mean like a lot of them for the first time are really having to like you know adopt digital in, in a in a in a mainstream way so like you know with the tradition there with pieces of software for like their finance system and that but like now the opportunity with customer insights and where you get that and pulling your data across your entire business like that's a real game changer but that also needs to change your mindset because it and it also has to you have to deal with the fears that people will have because, you know, it, it's a different way of working. And I think one of the big challenges we see with companies in when they're looking at digital transformation is 
how do you also ensure that you bring everybody on that journey together? And that that's really difficult. Like change is very hard for a lot of companies and particularly in non-tech sectors, uh, getting that involvement is really key. And what we've seen with one or two companies who've done some of the digital transformation aspects is they've kind of gone back to base principles in a way. And so what they've approached it is looking at and said, OK, so this is this is where we're kind of going on, on our roadmap of what we want to do. And they've took the staff on that journey with them and been very clear that the digital transformation is helping them as a tool to aid them on their journey. And so they're kind of given the big picture but also by where they fit on that journey and, and bringing that together. Now, now, that takes time and it's very difficult. We've we've also had some companies who've gone the other way and they've admitted themselves that they, they thought it was a technology problem and they went down that route and they put in a piece of technology and then they realised that they were no better off. They just had a piece of technology that replaced an older bit but fundamentally they hadn't done any transformation. So those challenges are there and I think there's that's the value that like working with IVI can give that is you have that expertise about guiding companies on that journey, talking them through the pitfalls, helping them to understand the complexities that digital transformation is. And and it is not a very simple process. And I think the larger the companies, the more difficult that becomes and the scalability of that becomes a challenge. And the tools like generative AI now are really something that if used correctly within digital transformation has the power to really help companies scale and benefit from that uh, because it would allow we get insights from data for the first time that maybe not a normal people who aren't tech friendly but they can now use that within that to, to those tools to get information from the business and i think there's there's a really interesting angle there personally i would say for digital transformation with generative ai tools that that can be built in to make it easier across the business to help on productivity. And that's probably an area of research that if it's not done, we'll be very interested in see how that develops over time. Um, but yeah, it's it's a fascinating area at the moment. And I think great. I would encourage all companies to go and talk to IVI about exploring what this could be and, and opportunities within that. Thanks a million, John. That's a, yeah, that's a, that's a great summary. And Karen, maybe can I just uh, you know in, in terms of that um, interdisciplinarity and by a multidiscipline you know environment, I mean you you had to to do that you know with, with kind of potential users of the um you know of, of your product um you know both from a clinicians perspective but also from you know um uh, you know ordinary users uh, and I, and. I, can you kind of maybe talk a little bit about the importance of putting the users at the at the, the center of, of the innovations that you're you're trying to develop? I suppose even for the focus group, to me, it's very important for any health, anything you do in health, you always have to put the user, the ultimate user on it. And if you don't have them in a focus group, it's never going to work. Um, so I just think you have to have a clinician and a potential user, be that the clinician or a person who's going to use it, you'll always, I hate putting a patient's name on something because this is about wellness and health. But um, like if you're going to have, whether be it a person that's going to use it or a clinician that's going to use it. So initially my idea for this was that it was always going to be clinicians, but it's now in talking to both the IVI and also when went into merits and did the, the workshop in around your business opportunities, it kind of opened up the whole idea as to where this platform would actually sit. So to have users and different users and opening it up, it was great to have such a, a variety of people on that focus group. And we, we learned a lot out of it. Um, I think even Bridget and the team were, were we, we got a lot more information and even some of the questions even or answers even surprised me because you're quite focused on your own particular area. So it's nice to get a much broader um and a much broader influence on it and and it just helps you to develop the right tool. That's great. Thanks, Karen. Um so um I maybe just just before I, I have one question from online, but maybe just to bring Lady Anne and, and Erica in, in on in on that topic as well. I mean, how do you you both, you know, you've come from quite uh, diverse backgrounds as well and you have experienced that interdisciplinarity within the organizations you're working with. How, how do you see that as um, you know important with the projects that you're you're currently working on? 
Maybe Eric, if you'd like to go first. Yeah, sure. Um, so it's really interesting actually to see how even if like the doctoral candidates are coming from different academia background, different sectors and disciplines, we're still able to uh, combine each other skills, let's say, and aim to the same goal, which is the one about leveraging the RV data. Uh, so like in my case, my background, it's the, my master is in finance. Uh, so then in Deloitte, I was able to do uh, more about the data cleaning. That's why in the end, I aim to this type of sector, the data one. Um, so for me, it's, that's why I also aim for this type of PhD, for the inter interdisciplinarity and intersectorality as well. Ladian, if you want to add some. Yeah. Well, I thought this PhD would be really interesting because uh, nowadays everybody's talking about sustainability, but to achieve this sustainability, we need to have specific measures and be able to know like how we can contribute to that. So that's why that is becoming really an important asset. And in my master's, I did about the business analytics. And then afterwards, I was like, okay, so I did this master's, I can learn a little bit more. And then what is the trending and the, and the, 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 the skills needed at the moment? And then I saw that uh, agriculture is the biggest one because it's also considered one of the sector that pollutes the most and to achieve the targets by 2030, we needed to address that. And I was like, okay, so maybe data and agriculture, it's the best combination. Thanks, Lydia. Okay. Thank uh, so maybe just to move on to the, the question that we've got online, just about um, you know innovation partnerships. Um, so we have a question on the, the timeline of getting an innovation partnership approved. What's the timeline on that? Um, but maybe first of all, I'll ask the second part of the question. Um, maybe Raj, I keep going to have a think about that, and, and we will we'll come back to you. But um, Emer, it was the question is how did Kilken Design build this into their operational strategic planning in their organization? Um, it's difficult to, to give time on these initiatives when focused on the operational side. Yeah, so that's that's um, you know I, I guess a, a good um, you know good question is how do you you know how do you focus on these types of strategic initiatives when you've got the day-to-day -day stuff going on. And I guess you, 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 you know, even from what I saw the project, there was a lot of that, so, especially during COVID. Um, there was a lot of, uh, you know, decisions that needed to be made in a very fast moving environment. Absolutely. No, I think it's a great question. Um, ultimately, it's about using an innovation partnership, I think, for maybe an opportunity or a gap or something within the business so that it becomes embedded as part of um, areas that you're addressing within the business. If it's an add-on to say day-to-day -day or not part of solving um, a challenge or bringing an opportunity, then Paul, it probably becomes, I would say, something that is nice to do rather than something that can actually really achieve something. That's probably number one. I think all companies um, would typically do strategic planning, budget planning, etc. and will identify um, true SWOT analysis, what are the areas of opportunity threats. And this is a great um, a great method through which to address some of those and to take advantage of some of those. So I think that's number one. And, and as um, John mentioned earlier, bringing the company with you, making this part of what we do um, and making, I suppose, that whole change management piece that people see this as an opportunity to take advantage of areas that you know, her known opportunities and also to address challenges. So that's probably a big thing. It's embedding it in the organization as being a tool to unlock potential so that everyone makes it part of um, the day job rather than an add on or a nice to have. I think that's probably number one. Absolutely. There's peak times of year. So when engaging with something like this, it's important that you look at how busy the year is. Everyone will say the year is always busy. It absolutely is in retail. In Q4, though, it's probably a level of nuts versus the rest of the year. So that might be not a good time to start an innovation partnership and give it um, real focus and attention and, and complete a roadmap. But I think, again, once you're looking at this with from a longer term vision perspective, looking at it from a planning perspective, embedding it as part of what you do in the organization, bringing the key people within the organization on the journey so it's not just one person spearheading an innovation partnership, they're the pitfalls and they're the kind of things that you have to watch for um, because there's a team that are going to make this happen. And as John alluded to earlier as well, it's a multidisciplinary team. And it's really important that they're all on that journey with you to set it up for success. Thanks, Seymour. And could you maybe comment as well, just in terms of the timeline and getting it approved originally? Was that um, 
you know was sure like, um okay. yeah so for for us it actually it took us maybe about six to eight months it did take quite a bit of time we were coming from retail though so we faced different challenges in getting these types of vouchers approved i think but um, you know, we have novel kind of, um, I suppose, data platform um, as our topic, um, which we went forward with. And again, that approved the funding a much quicker, I would say. Um, but I think some 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 industries would get approval probably a little bit quicker than um, retail would, if I'm honest, Paul. And um, yeah, but I think it was good, too. I wouldn't rush into the process either, because I think there was a lot of finding out around along that route of the six to eight months of what we really needed, because, again, technology is the enabler. And that's the key thing I think that everyone needs to remember. It's not something that's going to unlock everything. You need to understand what you're really looking for and how will that enable you rather than it being the full solution, because it's absolutely not. And everyone around your team needs to be aware of that and the role that they're going to play. So there's benefits too in not rushing into these partnerships without a proposal that makes sense and a, um, an objective that you're, re that you're looking to hit with milestones and with key targets. I think that's really the benefit um, of taking time on getting this right rather than ticking a box, getting funding and then actually what have you achieved and what what were you setting out to achieve or did the same thing. Thanks, Emer. Um, yeah, and, and I think maybe that's that points to what we found as well. And maybe Rajat, you can comment on this in terms of the innovation vouchers being a really good way to explore an idea first while you're developing um, a proposal for, for an innovation partnership. Um, and now, Rajat, maybe do you want to have a quick comment on that? Yep, yep. And also talk about the deadlines on the innovation partnership uh, program. So, so the pre-application phase is variable. Then when you submit the first uh, proposal, uh, outline proposal, after that, it takes around two months uh, to get a uh, uh, decision by uh, EI. And then it takes, then you submit the full proposal and then it takes around, around two to three months to get a uh, approval from IRCC and then another uh, two to three weeks for the project to start up. So it takes essentially around somewhere between four to six months for the whole uh, project to come into fruition. Thanks. And yeah, as as uh, as you were saying, like uh, uh, like the key key thing around like I'll also talk about like the multidisciplinary approach we take while uh, on our innovation voucher pro uh, uh, projects and we engage with the. Uh, uh, students and researchers from across multiple disciplines, be it the School of Business, Computer Science Department, Data Science Department, so as to get a more holistic and a uh, comprehensive view around uh, uh, the problem. And uh, with with the solution, uh, uh, with uh, the solution being user centric at its core. Thanks, Roger. I, I know Karen has to, to run now. So listen, thanks very much, Karen, for your participation and for, for outlining the project. Really appreciate uh, your your participation. Um, John, you were you were nodding along there, and I, I know you've a lot of experience of of um, you know, um, helping organisations to build innovation partnership proposals. Would you would you like to comment on those timelines, or you know, any any advice that you'd give a, an organisation in terms of maybe shortening those? Yeah, so I I would I would, I would echo what Emer said there, like having to think about what you want to put into it because sometimes you might rush in and then you end up going through multiple iterations back and forth and so if it's a weak application Enterprise Ireland will say actually there's not enough in this and then it comes back and then you go through it again so actually taking a bit of time and formulating that and being very clear about what you want out of the innovation partnership is really important. And if that doc if that initial document is very strong and it goes in, it goes through the process then fairly quickly within that. I used to be an assessor in, in Enterprise Ireland in the past. So uh, I, I could I could see speak from that side. Um and fundamentally I think what's really clear, what what's really helpful for those documents is be clear about what the objectives are. Be very clear about what IVI or the research institute is going to be doing on that. And then the third part is be very clear what is the outcome or the benefit for the business. And I think if you if you structured with those three components in it and you're able to elaborate and draw them out, that makes that process much straightforward than within Enterprise Ireland then for, for getting that and it gets it a faster piece through it. Where those three components are not very clear, that's normally where you have the iterations and back and forth. So as as you said, using an innovation voucher can be a really good way to help refine some of that or taking the time to actually sit down and think about, OK, how do we maximize the value in that and get into it? And I think Emer's scenario there where what happened there and planned it out and then 
really delivered and the outcome was very successful. That's what I've tended to see when I when I worked in the innovation voucher in the past. That the 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 ones that were more better planned and had a concrete deliverable on what they were expecting tended to come up with the most successful results. I mean, it's not surprising, you know, better planning always usually leads to better outcomes. But but I think sometimes people rush in and go, oh no, I'll, I'll get the application, I'll get the funding. Like that's really the core, what they want to do. But actually spending a bit more time makes a huge difference. The quality is better. The process is faster in the end of the day and everybody gets a better experience. And also what that can lead is, is easier then to go back for a follow on one or another innovation partnership because you've got, you now you've know the process and it, it gets easier then after that. So um, I, I'm a big fan of the innovation partnerships. I, I think there's, there's a lot of opportunities with that, but just being a bit strategic, having the vision, the, what, what IVI or the piece will do and be very clear on that. And then the final piece is the outcome for the company. And keeping that in mind when you do those applications and defining them clear streamlines everything for for that. So that's been my experience anyways on the innovation uh, uh, partnerships. Uh, thanks, John. That, that makes an awful lot of sense. Uh, so we're, we're almost out, out of time. Uh, Mark, maybe I'll just hand over to you, to you. Maybe any comments or any any observations on, on those questions so far? I thought it was fantastic. Yeah, just picking up on the last kind of uh, point the discussion on this. So I think yeah, the preparation phase and knowing exactly the outcome, the roles within these projects is extremely important. So the planning pays off uh, basically during the project then. And also, um, at least we from the Innovation Value Institute, with our partners, with our members, it's not about the one project, 12 months delivering a model or a technology. It's about the long-term journey, the long-term collaboration, helping organizations really on that guidance on where on the topics and it might be multiple projects it might be multiple collaboration opportunities in various forms starting with an innovation voucher maybe an innovation partnership then maybe a european project or something else uh, around this and that's i think is was it, the benefit on the end because to understand both kind of the <clears throat> the industry or the organizational side the challenges the capabilities, what researchers, what research academia can provide and bringing that together into a really valuable collaboration. That's the key to this. Again, that engagement model, I think, is extremely important uh, and doing that right. And that takes time. And that's, I think, why uh, strategic partnerships, long term collaborations are far more beneficial than just going for the 12 months uh, technology oriented project, getting maybe some funding. But that's it then. Um, and, and I think what we develop our really strong partnerships, also the membership model for IBI, for our partners, that community works very well. And finally, I know we are almost under half an hour now, uh, just a final comment on a lot of these projects and collaborations started with a coffee. So that coffee, that first step or the email, the first conversation is so important to basically maybe coming to Maneuver University and having that conversation, or we can do it online, is, is that the first step and then exploring opportunities around this. So yeah, a lot of coffee, but I, on the end, it's really beneficial uh, for both sides, uh, I hope at least. So that's, yeah, that's my final moment and I hand back to Paul. Thanks, Marcus. So uh, just as a final uh, thing, I'll just share our... Um... Uh, upcoming events. Uh, sorry, uh, wrong slide. This one. Uh, so yeah, our next webinar is on Tuesday, 26th, 22nd of October, uh, from three to four thirty. And it, in this case, you know, one topic that came up was um, you know, about the the sustainability challenge. So this one is about to accelerate the circular transition in the construction sector. That's our next webinar. Uh, just a reminder to you know stay to stay up to date with, with us and please sign up to our newsletter or uh, follow us on LinkedIn or um, Twitter. Uh, and of course, if you need to contact us about anything, info at ivi.e, just email that and, and your query will be will be uh, directed appropriately. Uh, so yeah, as a final uh, thing, I'd just like to thank all our, our uh, participants today. That was a fantastic discussion. And yeah, I just really encourage any any companies uh, attending today, just contact us and we'll, we'll point you in the right direction in terms of you know, how, to, how to engage uh, with these complex topics and 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 how and we can we can figure out how we can support you with, with uh, the various funding streams and uh, to do that. Okay, with that, um, I think we'll we'll bring it uh, to an end. One minute uh, to spare.
So listen, thanks again to all our panelists for for your 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 inputs. It was uh, it was really fantastic. So yeah, with that, we'll close the webinar. Thanks very much. Hello.